Hello, I'm Jerry Prince from Johns Hopkins University. I'm going to tell you about some of the new approaches for magnetic resonance image harmonization that we've developed in my laboratory. The problem is that MRI lacks standardization. Here are two images that are both T1 weighted, and you can see although they have strong similarity, they are different subtly in the tissue contrast. So what happens with this is that it creates problems in post-processing. That if you design an algorithm, for example, for the MP rage, it won't work all that well for the SPGR image. And as a result, registration errors can occur, inconsistent volumetrics, and even algorithm failure. A common solution to this problem is histogram matching. If we have a subject, for example, uh, that has the histogram shown on, underneath, but our algorithm has been developed for this contrast, the target contrast in the center, with basically a different histogram, it's certainly possible to match the histogram, modify the subject image so that it has the same histogram as the target. In that case, we are going to affect the way the algorithm works. So if you have an original image and you process it this way, you get this result. If you harmonize it in this histogram matching way, then you get a different result uh, in the same algorithm. And in this case, things have gotten worse. There's a lot of CSF that has been classified incorrectly as gray matter. And the reason for this is this particular subject has very large ventricle and really shouldn't have the same representative uh, tissue quantities as the target images themselves. So there have been alternative strategies proposed. For example, white matter peak normalization analyzes the histograms, find the white matter peak, and aligns them with a particular uh, number uh, in, in a final image. You can do a little bit better than that by analyzing the histogram to find some other representative peaks, such as CSF and gray matter, and align those uh, in a linear, piecewise linear histogram normalization scheme. Physics-based image synthesis has been around for a long time. The idea here is that you acquire multiple images on the scanner, estimate some fundamental property like T2 across the image, and then synthesize new images with arbitrary uh, uh, contrast using a uh, physics-based imaging equation such as shown here. Uh, this technique is good for generating an array of uh, image contrast, but is not really that good at harmonizing across scanners because the estimate of the T2 map underlying this is often very inconsistent. Classification-based uh, harmonization has been done. Here you classify the tissues according to an algorithm and then input whatever underlying tissue properties that you want and synthesize an image from those tissue properties. There's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem here. You have to classify the tissues and uh, first before you've harmonized it. And so this runs into a, a definite problem. And also classification of, uh, is, is fraught with possible errors as well. Registration-based synthesis or normalization has also been done uh, some years ago and continues to be popular. Uh, the idea is that you have an atlas of desired contrasts, the target contrast, for example, and you register that one of those images, for example, into the uh, target uh, or the subject image, and then you drag along any other contrast that you want from the atlas using that transformation that you computed. And this gives you, uh, lets the, the subject have the tissue contrast from the atlas. This is great in principle, but it is highly dependent upon the registration method. And again, a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. Will the registration be reliable if the subject image is quite different in contrast than what you would normally expect? Statistical normalization has come up more recently uh, and especially designed to focus on specific types of tissue. For example, in this example, focusing on getting the gray matter to be consistent across uh, a number of images. And it's good for analyzing, for example, anomalies that you might find, uh, lesions and other things in the gray matter itself, but is not a broad-based uh, uh, harmonization technique for the entire image and all the tissue classes. Lastly, and most recently, patch-based methods have been proposed. I'm showing uh, three examples of research from our group uh, in the citations here. Uh, where we first started with patch-based sparse reconstruction, went on to random forest, and now 
uh, like many, have been uh, using deep networks to do this. And that last citation I'll be describing in more detail in a bit. So what are some of the scenarios that are important for harmonization? Uh, one that I will consider in a bit is uh, same site, but you're switching the scanner hardware or software. Uh, and you'd like to be able to do consistent analysis uh, from what you had before to what you have afterward, in particular for longitudinal analysis or tracking of subjects. Well, if you have an overlapping cohort, then it's possible to train a supervised image translation network quite directly. This is what I'll be describing in my first example in a bit. But if you don't have any overlapping subjects, well, you still have available pools of data from the before and after time frame that you can use to do the harmonization. Uh, and a common way of doing this these days would be to apply a cycle GAN. I won't be talking about that approach, but I will be comparing one of our methods against the cycle GAN. What if there's multiple sites? Well, most likely, of course, you well, obviously you have different scanners and you're also going to have different acquisition protocols. So what is harmonization used for? Well, pooling the data and perhaps providing larger uh, scientific analysis across larger numbers of subjects for cross-sectional analysis, for example. Well, if you have traveling subjects that can go from site to site, then you can also train a supervised image translation network, as in the previous case I described above. If there are no traveling subjects available, well, can we share uh, data? If we can, then we can generate the data pools that I also described above and potentially harmonize in that way. But if there's no data sharing available and you simply have one image or just a few images, then an alternative will be to use domain adaptivity. And I'll be describing an approach for that as well in a bit. So first, out of three examples I'll be describing is harmonization using an overlap cohort. This was reported uh, in Makai Sashimi a few years ago and uh, in a journal uh, paper last year. So the scenario repeating a little bit here is that we have one site with an old scanner and lots of data, uh, and we have a new scanner uh, and uh, with lots of data potentially uh, over time accumulating this and developing an algorithm on the new scanner because, for example, the data is a higher quality typically. Uh, and in this case, we might have an overlapping uh, cohort, uh, a smaller number, but suitable for training uh, a harmonization technique that can take the old data and make it look more like the new data. Here's an example of the kind of problem that we're addressing. Uh, I'm showing from scanner one, two of the representative images, MP-RAGE, which is T1-weighted, and FLARE image, which is fluid attenuated inversion recovery, and often used for highlighting or emphasizing lesions as is present in this individual's white matter. In scanner two, uh, it's the same individual. You can see that things look different. Uh, the tissue contrast is subtly different. Um, and uh, in any processing that you might develop for one or the other is likely to come out uh, a little bit different. So what we have available are actually four image acquisition types, flare, T1-weighted, PD-weighted, and T2-weighted on the scanner, the first scanner and second scanner. And we have 12 subjects that were acquired within 30 days of each other on both scanners. So what are we going to do? Well, we're using a typical uh, uh, UNET architecture, which is the most popular biomedical image analysis uh, deep network. And we're gonna put four images in, and we're gonna get four images out of this network, predicting all of them at once. A uh, note on the pre-processing, uh, we're using anti-aliasing and super resolution on all the low resolution images, which includes older flare images and all of the T2 and uh, proton density weighted images. I won't be describing how that works. We'll be co-registering everything and doing white matter peak normalization on all the images before we put them into the network. So we could use a 3D network, but with just eight uh, subjects to train with. We're going to train with eight and test on four. Uh, that's really not enough. So we're using 2D networks. <clears throat> and we're going to use a 2D network in the axle, sagittal, and coronal orientations. When those networks are applied, you get three different volumes uh, that are representative of the new contrast. 
With those three volumes, we can take the median, which just means take the center value of the three, and therefore we can avoid extremes and inter-slice uh, inconsistency this way. So what do we get? Here's some input data on a held out data set that we do have uh, a subject scanned on scanner one and scanner two. This is showing you uh, sagittal slices uh, from before the scanner one and then scanner two. You can see the differences that we've pointed out before. After harmonization, uh, the scanner one looks a lot more like the scanner two in contrast, uh, in tissue contrast on both images, the MP rage and the flare. But now we look at scanner one harmonized result and realize it looks subtly different than scanner two. And maybe there's still going to be differences in the way that they're processed. In particular, scanner one harmonized looks a little bit blurrier and also seems to have higher signal to noise ratio. So we actually did a second network to harmonize scanner two to itself and produced a harmonized version of scanner two. So the new harmonized space is like scanner two, but just subtly different. And these are the two results on the harmonization. A small numerical comparison was possible because we trained on eight and tested on four. Uh, so we were able to do a threefold cross validation on the overlap cohort and found out that indeed the structural similarity was strongly improved, a statistically significant uh, result uh, uh, over simple white matter peak harmonization and simply applying the super resolution, which is the SSR. We also found that the mean squared error was much better as well uh, after harmonization using this technique. As an example, on one subject imaged over a long time period from 2008 to 2017, uh, we're showing uh, the flare images on the equivalent slice of that individual. Uh, and you'll notice over time, there are differences. In 2008, the image was actually quite a low resolution flare image. In 2011, the subject happened to have moved a little bit during acquisition and made some motion artifacts. And then you can see um, in 2017, we have the new scanner and things do look different in tissue contrast and actually noise as well. The harmonized results are shown below uh, and you can see very strong similarity. In fact, uh, at first glance, they look like the same image but this is an individual that has multiple sclerosis. And if you look more carefully and throughout the slices, you'll see that there have been changes in the brain, some atrophy and also uh, white matter lesions that have in some cases come and gone and other cases come and stayed. Now I'm going to talk about a different scenario and a different way of doing harmonization in MRI. This scenario has an algorithm that's been developed on a large set of data at one site. And we want to use that algorithm on data that comes from other sites, but there is no overlapping cohort. There's no traveling subjects, but we do have access to the data from the other sites. So what can we do? Well, some might use a cycle GAN, but we want to approach uh, this without even using a GAN. And what we recognized is that many, many times the data that one gets uh, off an MR scanner has both a T1 weighted and a T2-weighted image. And in the case of this IXI data from Guy's Hospital uh, that we were able to use, that was the case. And the same for two sites. These are the two scanners I just talked about at Johns Hopkins. So the idea that we would actually have two different contrasts of the same subject is similar to a traveling subject. And we want to exploit that. So we recognize that within the site, we have the same anatomy, but a very large difference in contrast. And across these sites on a given row, we have different anatomies, but subtly different contrasts, uh, differences. And you'll see here that I've established a bit of notation. We're going to talk about anatomy as a beta uh, parameter and contrast as a theta parameter. So the idea of disentangled latent space is to separate these uh, parameters. We want to be able to, from a given image, find out what's the underlying anatomy, that would be beta, 
And what's the underlying pulse sequence? That would be theta. The anatomy is going to be represented as a multi-channel, one-hot uh, uh, set of features. And theta is going to be represented by a simple scalar or maybe two scalars, as I'll show later in the talk. So we need to find the encoder parameters that are going to disentangle theta and beta. How are we going to do that? Well, to start with, we have the T1-weighted and T2-weighted pairs. They are the same anatomy at any given site. And we can put any pair in from any site that we want into this training of the encoder. And the idea of the encoder is that after it's trained, it should be able to separate theta from beta, as is shown here. What can we do with the theta and beta? Well, we can swap them around. For example, we could take the theta that's learned from the T1 image and apply the beta that's learned from the T2, and that should be synthesizing an image that looks like the T2. So then, as you'll see, it can be compared to the T2 image. But we don't want beta to learn anything about theta and vice versa. So what we're going to do is randomize how we choose beta in order to confuse the, the decoder so that it does not know where the original uh, separation came from and what was the original image. Going into that in a little bit more depth, with training, as I mentioned, we have T1-weighted and T2-weighted. We're going to put them into the encoder at different times, but the encoder will share the weights. So then, out of the T1, we're going to have the uh, theta that's produced, which in this case happens to be a negative number, minus 1560, and the betas as well that are going to be produced. And in this case, we have five one-hot encoded uh, volumes, or slices in this case. And uh, if we put in the T2, we're going to get a different theta, uh, and hopefully similar beta. We want to encourage that during training, so we're going to have a similarity loss that will encourage similarity between these betas when there's paired input. So now we can put in uh, uh, T1 and T2, uh, and, and in this case, I'm showing examples of putting them in paired and then getting another set. And we're going to then be able to swap the betas around during uh, randomization during training. And so we can not just swap the entire beta, all of the five channels, but we can swap any channel that we want, right? And so there's 32 possibilities for what uh, betas can be produced. We chose four of these per batch, which is why you'll see um, that, uh, that four of these uh, decoders uh, and four images on the next slide. So these are going to be, after swapping, run through the decoder. Now the decoder is going to produce synthetic images that should look like the theta, uh, that contrast that has been put in, and they should have the correct anatomy, that is, if the beta has been generated correctly. And over time, with training, we expect the encoder to be able to do better and better at providing similar uh, betas for both the T1 and the T2 image. Well, once we produce this image, these sets of images, again, four channels arbitrary for, for each batch, we can compare those images against what they should look like because, of course, we have the original images. So this is the second loss, which is a reconstruction loss uh, during training. And we're going to, of course, have multiple sites so we can continue to repeat this training uh, for all of the different sites. Now, at any time, once it's trained, we can plug in a new image and generate whatever theta the, net, the encoder thinks that image represents. So for example, it might represent uh, a T2 weighted on the left here, or it might represent a very T1 weighted as on the right. But if we plug in all of the data from all of the sites that we trained from, and in this case, we trained from three sites, we're going to see that we get a range of theta values for the different sites. And as was expected, uh, these sites are relatively separate because the images do look relatively different in the different sites. But they're not exactly the same 
in site B and site A because there is variation from subject to subject and scan to scan. Now we can then take any given theta for this particular anatomy and generate any uh, synthetic image. And I'm showing three more that are representative of site B, site A, and the IXI site. We can also generate an image that doesn't really look like any naturally acquired uh, image somewhere in between a T2 and a T1, which although we don't at present have a use for this, we, it might be at some point found to be useful to generate these type of artificial images. But we want to go back to harmonization. How would we harmonize images coming from any site to a particular site? Well, we might calculate the mean of the thetas at that site, for example, the mean uh, of site A, and make that the target contrast that we want all of the images to look like. Then we take a representative Im image from anywhere, from any site that we've trained from, and for example, the IXI, site A, and site B, and then we generate their betas and their thetas. Now, uh, that's just running them through the encoder. But to synthesize images that would be more similar to site A, we want to take the mean value of theta from site A and replace the true thetas, but keep the anatomy. And that will generate synthetic images that look more like that which would be acquired from site A. You notice that even site A has a synthesized image, and that is because we might have shifted the uh, theta A to the theta bar A, even at site A. We did have some overlap data that we held out from training uh, in site A and site B, and we evaluated the PSNR and found the significant increase uh, after harmonization in the uh, similarity of appearance between the two sites. So this technique directly trained a harmonization network without any traveling subjects or without any GAN models, but it did require T1 weighted and T2 weighted pairs at each site. A nice thing about this is that the latent space is interpretable. Uh, we understand that there's a representation of the anatomy and a representation of the pulse sequence, which allows us great flexibility in the synthesis task. Uh, and finally, we can harmonize by using an average theta at any given site. Now, I'd like to talk about yet a different scenario that uh, we had a paper recently reported uh, at uh, Mackay as well. And this scenario is that we may have lots of data at, and an algorithm at one site, and we receive a single image from outside. Uh, and we don't have access to a large amount of uh, images from that site, but we would still like to be able to process that image using our algorithm. How might, might we do that? Well, we're going to specialize this for the specific task that we've developed at our site. So that might be a synth synthesis task or a segmentation task. In either case, uh, or some other task, we're going to uh, use something that might look like uh, a standard UNET. So I'm just showing uh, uh, a standard UNET that might be used to do one of these tasks. So what we're going to do is augment this UNET with autoencoders on features at many levels within the UNET. And then during training, we're going to be training the UNET itself for the task, but also the autoencoders. So far, we haven't had any outside image coming in. We're just doing this at our own site. Now, when it comes time for testing and we do have that extra image, we're going to be adding some adapters, some layers, simple layers, uh, just prior to the features that uh, we have the autoencoders trained for. So you'll see them throughout this new uh, network. And then during the testing phase, we want to train only the adapters using that single image in order to get uh, a minimal autoencoder reconstruction loss. There is some tricks that have to be applied uh, in order to make this work effectively. Those are described in our Mackay paper. So as an example, uh, let's say that in site A, we've trained a T1 to T2 synthesis. This might be something we want to do 
if we anticipate getting a lot of T1 data from other sites, but those data lack the T2, and our algorithm needs a T2 in order to operate effectively. So for example, if we get another image from site B and we chose one that looks quite a bit different, uh, what happens if we run the network without any adaptation? We get something that vaguely looks T2-like, uh, but if you look carefully, and I'm not zooming it here enough for you to observe it in detail, you'll see that the features are a bit blurry. Uh, there's some inconsistencies in the results. And if I look at the real T2 image, site B after all did have a real T2, although we're not using it, you'll see that it does look quite a bit different than the real T2. And it also looks different than the contrast of site A of T2. Our method produces uh, an image that's much clearer. Uh, it uh, is uh, not still got quite the contrast of the site A T2, but it is um, uh, much clearer and a bit more usable than the, uh, than the one uh, that was generated from the no adaptation. Now, some might say that it's possible to use a cycle GAN here uh, to do this. And so we explored that idea, but realized that, well, you really still need pools of data. So perhaps site B has pools of T1 data. They're not matched to any of our T1 data, but we can build a cycle GAN that will produce a synthetic T1 that would look much, much more like the data site A. And then we can take that synthetic T1 and run it through our network and generate a synthetic T2. This image looks very similar to the one we generated with our algorithm. Uh, it looks maybe a little bit more in uh, contrast, uh, similarity of contrast to the true T2 contrast. But generally speaking, it should be noted that we did ours without any uh, uh, pools of T1 data with just that single T1 image. Now, there is an adapter at the very highest level of our method, and that adapter does actually produce something that looks like a T1, and this is the image that we get. Uh, you'll notice that it really doesn't look like the T1 uh, contrast at site A. It's not quite there, but that's not the purpose of, of, of the adaptation. The purpose was to get the T2, and this is just to show you that, in fact, the adaptation probably works best at multiple levels not just the, the highest level. And that's why there are adapters at all the different levels of features in that unit. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on some newest developments, Leon Ray Zuo uh, with Blake Dewey, Yufan He, Yihao Liu, Aaron Karas, and myself have been working on this and trying to advance things further. Um, we added another site. Uh, this is still another IXI site. So we have four sites now that we're running the dis disentangled latent space approach uh, on. And the result uh, is that we have, uh, in fact, well, the other change is that we're now visualizing theta space that is two-dimensional. And so the result shows quite a bit of separation of these data as we would expect from the one-dimensional theta. But, and, and you can imagine it's sort of along a line here but it also, there's clearly two-dimensional spread uh, of, within the sites as well on, in this theta space. Um, now, representative images from the different sites are shown on the right, at the, at taken from the X's that you see on the left-hand plot. Now, if I want to harmonize these images to a given site, I first need to pick that site uh, that I want to harmonize it to, and I'm going to pick site C. And then I do the harmonization by generating data from each of those images using the average site C theta. And you can see the resultant location of the data that's been reanalyzed with our encoders to find out, well, what's the theta that it thinks it's produced? And the images that are harmonized are shown on the bottom. Uh, it's clearly much more uh, similar, all of the images, to the contrast of target site C. Well, I'll end there. I'd like to thank uh, uh, many people in my lab, uh, including some of the other uh, faculty members that, that we, I share research with, and also uh, those uh, 
collaborators in neuro, neurology at Hopkins who have really contributed a lot of time and effort uh, and data to our effort. Also, we've had several grants that have supported different aspects of this research, and I'd like to also uh, thank those sources of support. So I know this is a recorded lecture, uh, and, but there will be time for questions uh, at a later time. So thank you very much.